Welcome back to the Chris Allen Show, everybody. I'm your host, Chris Allen. Um, I'm going to pull the curtain back a little bit. This is my third time recording this episode. Uh, I want to say it was Friday I recorded the first time. I forgot to upload the file, so I'm like, damn, I got to come back to the studio just to get the file so I can edit this video, this episode of the podcast. So I wasn't going to be able to do that until Sunday, and it gave me all day Saturday to think about the episode. And I was like, yeah, you know what? I don't really like it. I don't think it's great. I should redo it. So Sunday, <laughs> I redid it. And afterwards, I was like uh, checking everything, and I realized my camera did not record anything at all. And I'm like, I don't want to put up the original one. And I don't want to do just sound. So here I am, uh, Monday night, September 11th at 11.50 doing the podcast. Because I told myself, if I want this to be something, I got to put in the time. I can't just post shit that I don't really like. So I'm here doing it. Uh, I'm doing it for y'all. I'm doing it for me. I'm doing it for the people who are here now. I appreciate you listening to this podcast because I'm really trying to get this everything I got. <laughs> I really am. So I appreciate y'all being here. All right. So I'm going to just jump right in. It probably won't be as long as the second one because it's pretty late. I got to get up at 6 a.m. Well, first of all, I got to record this drive home, uh, begin the whole editing process and at least let it um render and all that so i can upload it tomorrow so it's going to be a long night and a long day tomorrow but hey this is the life i chose i'm doing it with a positive attitude so let me just jump in um for those who don't know my wife and i we have a 10 year old son soon to be 11 his birthday is actually this friday and uh i like to talk about the different things that are going on in his life sometimes it's big sometimes it's small sometimes it's nothing and i'd like to call this section the milestone portion of the show because my son's name is miles so this week um he got his first middle school progress report and i know you're thinking damn that's early he just started like three weeks ago actually it's like two and a half weeks <laughs> actually yeah two weeks and he's already got a progress report but he's doing great um Straight A's and one B plus. And I know some people who are parents are like, did you say anything about the B plus? No, I did not. I did not. Uh, that's that's something I made a conscious effort not to do, even though I was I was curious because it's in math. He loves math. And I understand he's also taking seventh grade math, which is a little bit more advanced. So he might struggle with some of the concepts. But I left it alone. I go, I don't want my son to think that he, he has to be perfect all the time because he does not. I mean, it's basically straight A's. Now, if it fell to like a C minus or a D, we're definitely going to talk about it. But a B plus, uh, I'm not going to address it, at, especially not right then and there when he presents me, hey, look at my progress report, basically all straight A's and one B plus. I feel like that would really set the, send the wrong message if I was like, great, but what's up with this B plus? Uh, I've talked to some people and uh, they said they went through that as a kid and it really just kind of killed their confidence and it really killed their desire to want to do uh, good, do well, because they felt like uh, even, even if they gave it their best and it was a B that wasn't enough. And I know this is anecdotal, but, yeah, a friend of mine said it just, he just became a C student. He just got sick of the nagging and everything like that. And he said, fuck it, I, I, I feel like I'm never going to please uh, these people. So uh, I'm just going to go in here and, and do the bare minimum. <laughs> so, um and not saying my son would do that, but uh, I, 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 I just don't want to send the wrong message like, hey, we are striving for you to be perfect. But uh, my wife took a look at the progress report and she was like, hey, did you talk to him about the B? I go, I didn't, but I can. And uh, later that night, I just I just brought it up. I go, hey, buddy, I, I felt like you did a great job, but the, the not but I was going to B plus. I go, I know you love math. Is there are you struggling with anything? A B plus is good, but I just want to know. Is there anything going on? And he was just like, hey, man, this is seventh grade math. This is uh, <laughs> this is kind of hard. Sorry, man, my mouth is dry. I smoked weed at the uh, <laughs> at the mic earlier, and I've been talking to people all night, so my mouth is freaking dry. 
but we're very proud of him. Uh, we're taking him to uh, this little resort uh, across the mountain. He likes going there. Uh, and uh, they have like an indoor water park, and the hotel has an arcade and all these different things. Uh, it's one of those like uh, like Great Wolf Lodges, lodges or something like that, where, yeah, they just got all this stuff on the inside. Like I said, arcade, uh, just restaurants, the indoor water park. They have an outdoor water park, so he really likes that. So um, we're going to go spend the night up there Friday, uh, Friday night, and then Saturday, I believe we have access to the uh, water park, so... Uh, yeah, man, just, um, I'm proud of him. It's his birthday. Uh, we were looking at bikes the other day. I might surprise him with a bike. He really wants a phone, but I think we're going to wait until Christmas to get him the phone. And I, I believe I talked about this before, but he, he really wants that phone. And uh, I know, he, I know it would, it would be the best Chris birthday present right now, but we, we still got to do some research. I want my wife to be totally comfortable with it and we've got to find the right phone and situation for him. So, uh, and I say all that, and I know I'm and I'm just going to end up getting him a fucking iPhone like every other goddamn parent. So, but, uh, yeah, it, I, I think it's a, it's, it's a kind of hard thing to accept right now that he's at a point where he needs his own phone. Um, so, yeah, that's where we are with him. That's the milestone. He, he's doing great. He's doing great, basically straight A's. He's, he's loving school. He, he's he's uh, excited to go every day, and I don't want to kill that. I, I I love school as a kid. Um, he he's really enjoying middle school. He loves his friends. He likes his classes, and uh, yeah, I'm just really proud of him. And you know, happy birthday to the boy, Daddy loves you. All right, so I got about five minutes to talk about this nine eleven. Pretty crazy day in American history. Uh, I would say probably the most surreal moment of my life was watching that happen. Uh, I, re I remember I had a co-worker at the time. His kid saw one of the planes hit, and he was like, oh, Dad, that looks like a cool movie. I got to see that movie. And he had to tell his son, like, yo, that's, uh, that's, not, that's not a movie, man. That's, that's real life. And, uh, yeah, it was, it was a strange day, a very strange day. Everybody was scared. No one knew what was going on. Did we, were we in a war? Did, was it an accident? Was it done on purpose? And I think the biggest question on people's minds is, is this going to happen again? You know, just just not knowing what's going to happen next. <clears throat> I remember shortly after 9-11 and, and people kind of like calmed down a little bit. And uh, it was the first one of the first NFL games after it happened. And I'm stationed in Phoenix and it's, I'm at a Cardinals game. This is when they were still at Sun Devil Stadium and uh they're singing the national anthem and people are just going nuts. You know, people are just so patriotic and shit, just like loving America. And uh, they did a flyover. And this was the craziest thing. As soon as people heard the Jets fly over, it was a collective gasp throughout the entire stadium. I can't even tell you how many people, uh, Sun Devil Stadium capacity. Let me look it up. Stadium capacity. 53,000. There were 50, 53,599. So 53,599 people at the same time. A loud, audible gasp, and everybody looked up. And when we saw it, it was a fighter jet. It was just this sigh of relief. It was one of the craziest moments where everybody did it. Uh... Yeah. I mean, just for that split second, everybody was like, oh, my God, is this about to happen again? Uh, very odd moment. Uh, I also remember this, too. And some people will probably think I'm a patrol, but uh, people were so mad at me for this. It's Sun Devil Stadium. It's hot as shit. It's Phoenix. Yeah, it's like September, but it's still hot as fuck. I literally had a towel on my head with a Nike headband on it. And I got the dirtiest looks from people. I remember one dude was like, yo, take the fucking towel off your head, man. I go, it's, they don't really wear towels on their head, you fucking racist. But I, got, I literally got dirty looks from people for wearing, a, for wearing a towel on my head outside in the sun during a football game. Crazy. Crazy, crazy, crazy. People are... Uh, yeah, offended by that. But we saw a lot of crazy shit over the next few months, man. 
Um, yeah, it, uh, everybody remembers where they were, who they talked to. Uh, um, I remember sitting in a Cracker Barrel that day after we watched the news for a while. It was like me, my boy Chad, and I want to say it's my boy uh, Joe Martin. And we were just thinking, like, are we going to war? What's going on? I can't believe this. This is scary. And I remember looking around and just looking at everybody in that restaurant. Like, no one knows, in, no one in here knows what, what happened. Like, it had just happened. There's no TVs on. This is the early, two. this is 2001. People had cell phones, but at the same time, it was like, it was kind of still an emergency thing. And, and most people, even young people, didn't like carrying around cell phones. It was still kind of a weird thing. Like, why do I want to carry a phone around? Uh... But I think 9-11 was one of those events that kind of changed people's view on having a cell phone because you did hear the stories and, you know, from Flight 93 and whatever, people calling, you know, back home that, you know, uh, I'm not coming home, I love you, tell my kids I love you, all that kind of shit. I think 9-11 was one of those moments where people realized, like, shit, maybe I do need a phone, man, because you just, you just don't know what's going to happen. And here we are, 20 years later, to go back to my son. With all this shit going on in schools, I'm like, he should probably have a cell phone. You know, 9-11 was just one of those moments. It, it it just changed how we looked at certain pieces of technology. You know, at one point it was just like, oh, I don't carry around a phone. I don't want people to have access to me. And then it quickly became, what if I get caught up in a terrorist attack and I can't call my family for the last time? Wild, wild day. I remember my mom called me and woke me up. was like, we under attack. And I was like, what are you talking about? And I turned the news on and they were talking about it. I was like, oh, yeah, it was probably an accident. And a few minutes later, boom, the other one hit. And I was like, yeah, that wasn't an accident. I go, I got to call you back. I'm getting, like, calls from work. <laughs> I'm getting calls from work. It took so long to get on base that day, uh, a few hours I remember there was a dude who had, uh, he went to the Circle K that was right there at the corner of, uh, I want to say Litchfield and, uh, shit, I can't, in Litchfield Road and uh, 125th Avenue, something like that, in Phoenix. And uh, I think he was just driving by, but he got caught up in all the traffic around the base. So this dude gets out of his car, he goes into a Circle K and just buys a case of water and is just walking around the street selling it for like three dollars a bottle i mean on 9 11 somebody is just like oh i can capitalize on this and to make it worse this motherfucker is selling overpriced water bottles to uniform military personnel waiting to get on base to find out what the fuck is going on there's nothing more american than that somebody like oh a tragedy how can i make money and how can i make money off the troops and we haven't even, at that point, begun <laughs> all the shit that was going to happen. Very scary, man, pulling up on base in the states, in a landlocked state. And you come up to the gate and there's some pimple-faced 19-year-old security forces one-striper on top of a Humvee, visibly shaking, pointing a loaded 50 cal... <laughs> I don't want to call it a rifle, a 50 cal uh, gun at your car. Pointing a big ass gun at other uniform military personnel's vehicles. The hood come up, the trunk was up, They're, they got the dogs out, they checking the engine compartment, they got the stick with the mirror, they doing all that shit. I mean, this. I, I think each each car, they probably took 15, 20 minutes searching each car, it was crazy. It's a wild day. I'll, I'll, I'll never forget. I'll never forget it. Um, but I do think it's funny. I, I have to bring it up every year that like, look, it is a tragedy. It really is, man. And the thing is, we'll never forget that. But they always want people of color, black people to forget our own history, to forget our ancestors. Because it makes them uncomfortable. And most of us didn't even know anybody in 9-11. Just like most of us alive today. We didn't personally know any slaves. We were not a slave. But that's still our history. We still look at those pictures and those, in, in some cases, uh, um, I don't know about any video. I don't think it, it, there might be some video of, of slaves. Yeah, there are videos. There's videos now I think about it. 
But we look at all that kind of stuff and we put ourselves in, in those in those folks' shoes. And it hurts. And it's scary. And you're also like, man, that would have been me if I was born back then. So I, I can't forget a situation that would would have I would have clearly been in. You know? But to ask us to forget that or don't bring it up, this is uh, very uh, disrespectful. But then, yeah. And I, I'll say this, too, and I'm pretty sure it's going to piss some people off. I think it's time to stop reading the names. It's been t over 20 years, man. We're never going to forget those people, man. But the reading the names and stuff, it's just, I think we need to, I, I, I think we just need to, like, still uh, do a, a remembrance, man. But the, but the names and stuff, I feel like... Uh, I feel like we need to move on from that aspect of our uh, uh, celebrating. Uh, <laughs> celebrate is not the right word. Recognizing uh, the people that we lost. And I, again, I know some people are going to be like, "That's disrespectful." I just, I, I, I just think it's, it's we got to stop with the names. It's just I feel like at this point, uh, <laughs> we, 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 while remembering, I think we got to drop it. I just, I don't know, man. I, I felt that for like the last 10 years, if I'm being honest. After 10 years, it's like, come on, man. We got we got to stop. <laughs> ah. Am I wrong for that? That's just how I feel. I don't know. Um, all right, so football is back, everybody. College, uh, not a huge fan of college football. I'm, I'm really not the biggest fan of football uh, as a whole, but definitely not college. And I think it's because I really didn't play in high school. Like, uh, I love basketball. That's that's my uh, first love. So uh, college basketball doesn't bother me. And I know people who love college football, but they feel the same way I do about college basketball. It's too many teams that you don't know who's good. I feel the same way. And I will also say this. This will probably piss people off. I believe outside of, like, the top 20 or top 25 the rest of it is glorified high school football, and you do have some studs that are sprinkled around the country at these at different programs because of grades or they went to small schools or whatever it is. But other than that, I think it's a lot of it is not great. It's not worth being on TV, if I'm being honest. Um, but what's drawing me to college basketball football this season is the Deion Sanders stories. Him uh, going to uh, Colorado and coaching his sons and, and what he's going to do with that program after leaving Jackson State. That was a whole controversy. But, like, now people are behind him. I've seen a lot of people like, yo, I got to get this Colorado uh, merch. I got to get the jersey. I got to get the hoodie. I got to get that. And there's a lot of buzz around the, the program and what, what Coach Prime is doing. And I think it's dope, man. I think it's really, really dope. Um, his son is a great player. Uh, the 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 uh, the Nebraska game I watched it was a little sloppy at first but they got together uh, I didn't get to watch the TCU game but uh, based on the score it seemed like a, a real shootout the two and zero right now and I, 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 it seems like a lot of people are kind of surprised that he's having this much success already and I know there's going to be a lot of ups and downs but the story itself you, you gotta you gotta root for the guy I I, I love Deion Sanders uh, I I I love the story I love his journey. Uh, I mean, to be one of the most arrogant, flashy, uh, self-absorbed uh, diva athletes we've ever seen. And I'm not even saying any of that shit in a negative way because the thing about Deion Sanders is that nigga talk shit, but he could also back it up. Uh, I remember seeing that, that old picture of him from the draft. He's got the Jerry Curl and shit. I had never seen no shit like that. Deion Sanders draft. Images. 1989. Yeah, he's got the cell phone. He's got the go he got the gold chains on. Uh the dope shades. I mean, Dion was that nigga, man. This is exactly what athletes today look like. And he was already there in, in 1989. That dude was everything swag. He was fast. He was just Dion was that dude, and his and his and his Nikes were dope. I remember that my boy Anthony had the Dion Sanders with the big Nike Nike swoosh patch across the Velcro patch across the toe. So dope that those shoes, 
I remember Anthony walking up to us with those shoes on, and we were like, yo, what the fuck are those? He go, yo, these are the Deion Sanders. And I don't think at the time, I don't think Nike had a shoe or anything that had a swoosh patch that big on it. It was the the dopest shoe. That had to be the hottest shoe of the year. Had to be. That and whatever Jordan came out that year had to be because the Deion Sanders are some of my favorite shoes of all time. Never had them, but I, I would love to have those, man. Um, so, like I said, I like to watch some of the top 20, 25 stuff, and I saw that Alabama was playing Texas, and that's more my speed. That's more my speed. A lot of the mid-major teams are fun to watch, but I feel like a lot of it's just blowouts, man. You get you get a decent team, and again, a lot of just glorified high school players, man. And it, I, I don't like I don't like watching it, and uh, it's just crazy. Even with Colorado, they don't really look like a huge team, but you watch this Texas Alabama team, and like a lot of these dudes, and most of these dudes, if not all of them, they already look like NFL players. This is where you're going to see the six five receivers and all these 400-pound linemen and shit like that. Yeah, you might get some of those dudes in some of the smaller schools, but, like, these are the studs. And uh, I just I think the game is crisper, is faster. Because there were a few passes that Shador made where I was like, man, if he was playing against a, a better team, there's no way that pass is getting in between three defenders like that. The way he was able to lob that in like that. A beautiful pass, great pass. But against a better, a top twenty team, top ten, that ain't happening. And look, I'm not, and I'm not gonna act like I know a, a shit ton about college football. But I've seen enough to know, like at the highest level, that pass ain't getting in there, bro. That it ain't got enough velocity on the on that ball to get in there. It's a, it's a little too loose. But he's a great athlete. He's fun to watch. Uh, but back to the Alabama Texas game, man. I uh, I turn it on just to watch. Just as Alabama, not just to watch, just as Alabama was getting ready to run out, you got, uh, is it Nick Saban? Nick Saban. It's Nick Saban. I don't know why, man. It's been so long since I, I don't know why I thought he, uh, I don't know. I Like, I know Nick Saban, but he's a guy I'm always like, is that him? Is that the guy? It is him. But watching Nick Saban walk out with his team, and um, I'm watching all the, the guys on the team, and this everybody is so hyped, you know. They ready to go. And I was just thinking, there are kids all across this country just watching this, just chomping at the bit to play for Alabama one day. They just, they just want to be part of that uniform. They, wanna, they can't wait to walk out. And I'm looking at all these dudes like, yo, at some point in time, all these dudes on this team, they were that kid watching TV like, I would love to play for Alabama. And now they're doing it. They're getting to walk out. There's some freshmen getting to walk out for his first game in an Alabama uniform. Can't believe it. Also, think about those seniors, man. They're like, damn, this is it. I remember my first game. And here it is. I, I got, I got, this is my last season. And then it's on to something else. But just watching them run out, man, and just everybody going nuts, going crazy. I can't imagine how that feels. I know, man, if that was me, there's no way I could I could do that shit with a dry eye, man. No way I could do it with a dry eye. I can't. Uh, I, just, I, just, I just love seeing it, man. I, I, I will say this about college football. Even though I'm not the biggest fan, I think it's probably one of the coolest things you could ever do with your life as an athlete is be a college athlete. Could you imagine what it's like to be – a college quarterback at an SEC school or a wide receiver. I mean, that's, that has to be so much fun. I know it's a lot of work, but it has to be the best feeling in the world, man. Because at, at, at that point, it's still kind of a game, even though you have aspirations to, you know, um, to go pro. It's a lot of hard work, but at, to me, I feel like it's still a game. But then you get to the pros, and it it turns into work, and they like, man, this is this is where it all really begins. Like I worked my ass off to get here, but man, I didn't know it was gonna be this much harder to maintain it. I think that I think that's dope, man. I think that's great. Um, yeah, I didn't get to watch the Alabama Texas game. My wife wanted to watch something, so. We ended up just watching uh, some other shit, but uh, got to watch a little bit of it. And I, I, I told myself this year I'm going to try to pay more attention to college and pros. 
And to get to the pros, man, I, I'm, a, I'm a Giants fan. I think I told y'all deep down inside, I'm a, I'm a Packers fan. I've always liked Shannon Sharp. I was a huge Brett Favre fan, and I always check on them, see how they doing, what they got going on. So deep down, I, I, I'm always going to, like, see what the Packers are doing. I want them to win. But officially, I'm a Giants fan, and let me tell you, man, what they put out on the field this past Sunday was an embarrassment to football. 40 to nothing, man. That is insane that is <laughs> after it was 33 to nothing i was googling has any coach ever been fired after week one i just felt like you know somebody gotta go a offensive coordinator or defensive coordinator uh maybe daniel jones need to sit his ass on the bench but somebody somebody need to get fired somebody needs to lose uh their roster spot or something to shake that shit up somebody gotta go you can't, you can't, how do you come out game one and lose by 40 and you put up zero points? Zero points. I felt like after they got the field goal attempt blocked, it was, they were, they were done. They were defeated. They said, fuck it. We, we, this ain't our night. And it, and it definitely was not their night. For, for Giants, the, for y'all to go down the day before 9 11, the Giants to just get, to collapse like that, the irony. Come on, man. Y'all, y'all couldn't, y'all couldn't put up three points for nine eleven. Nothing. It's terrible. Forty to nothing, man. And I was excited. It's already tough, and I'm like, yeah, all right. This the season start was opening. We got the cow, and it's the fucking Cowboys. I hate the Cowboys. I just seeing that, just seeing that helmet makes me mad. And it's most NFL teams I hate is because of their fans. And now the, the Cowboys, they, they have all the right in the world to talk shit. They already think they're America's team. They always they already think that everybody loves them. They're Americana. But when you look at them, they haven't done shit for the last two decades. And I, I know they're not going to shut the fuck up about this. They're not. They're not going to shut up. I just, I just I hate when. Uh, a fan base of people I don't like have the right to talk shit. <laughs> I hate it. Um, so what I want to do with the uh, doing football season, I do want to do my picks. I'm not great at it, but I was like, you know what? If I'm gonna say, I'm, if, if I'm gonna watch, I need to find my. I need to find a way to be invested. And I was like, you know what? If I have picks every week, I think that'll help. Um, yeah, man. This. First week, man, it was just absolutely insane, man. For them to get just beat like that was just, it was gross. Gross to see. Oh, so the Jets ended up winning this Bills game. Okay, fine. And overtime? Damn. Okay. Yeah. So now now that that game was closed out, the Giants were the only team to not put up any any points at all. Nothing. 30-7, to seven, that's a blowout. 24 to 3 blowout. Yeah, 40 to nothing. Jesus, man. Terrible. I don't know what they're going to do. All right. So, week two. Uh, I'm going to pick the Eagles over the Vikings. I'm going to go with Ravens over Bengals. No. Bengals. Uh, you know what? Ravens over the Bengals. Uh, Lions over the Seahawks. I'm going to go Colts over Texans, Bucks over Bears, Chiefs over Jags, Packers over Falcons. I, you know what? I tried with the Bills, man. I, I, I said it on the earlier versions of the pod. I, I think they're going to win. You know what? Fuck it. I'm, I, I got to ride with the Bills. I'm riding with the Bills. Bills over Raiders. Chargers over the Titans. Niners over the Rams. If I was, I'm going with the Cardinals over my Giants. Especially if I, if I was betting. But I'm mad at them, so I, I can't I can't fuck with them this week. So next week, so I'm Cardinals over the Giants. Uh, Jets over Cowboys, even though that's likely not going to happen. I just hate the Cowboys. Broncos over the Commanders. Uh, Dolphins over the Patriots. 
I will take the Panthers over the Saints and the Browns over the Steelers. Why? Because I do not like the Steelers fans at all. I feel like the Steelers fan base is the worst fan base in the NFL. I don't care about the Raiders, none of that. I hate Steelers fans. Show me a Steelers fan that makes over $30,000 a year. They're poor. They're the, they're the GPC smoking crowd of the NFL. I've never met a Steelers fan that had a nice car, all right? I've never met a Steelers fan that dressed nice. I've never met a well-spoken Steelers fan. It's just, it's just something about that fan base I just absolutely detest. I, I, I don't know what it is, but they all annoy me. <laughs> so there. How about that? I do, I do like Coach Tomlin. And I like their colors. I like their uh, I like their uh, emblem. I like everything about the Steelers, except their fan base, the small market uh, town, the fa is family owned. Like the same kind of the same thing with the Green Bay Packers, man. I, I like that like kind of like small town old school feel, man. Where like uh, like uh, like I I just feel like. Um, like in Green Bay, that back in the day, Aaron Rodgers would just be at fucking Applebee's and nobody cared because it's such a small town. It's just, he, he's just there. Kind of like Dave Chappelle in Yellow Springs. Nobody really say shit because that's just where he live and everybody's like, yeah, that's cool. I feel like that's, I feel like Pittsburgh might kind of be like that too. Like, oh shit, they go, I don't even know who played for them. Oh, they go so and so. He's just chilling, having, having a Permanente Brothers sandwich with french fries on it. <laughs> By the way, Permanche Brothers, overrated, Pittsburgh. Sorry to tell you. Sandwiches, not that great. Not that great. I'm shitting all over Pittsburgh tonight. <laughs> and it's really not a bad town. I just don't like the fan base. I don't even know what happened to me. I don't even know what happened. I just, yeah, I don't know. I just, I just, I just don't like their fans. I just, I just don't. Not a, I just I hate him. And speaking of shit that I hate, uh, a friend of mine posted this crowd work video of him talking to this couple. They were having a baby, and he uh, he tried to ask them what their baby name was, and they go, whoa, whoa, whoa. I hate that shit, man. People who try to keep their baby name a secret. Like, to a degree, me being a parent, I get it. But at the same time, it's just like, look, man, you're not going to say some shit that's going to blow our minds to the point where we're like, yo, did you hear this fucking baby name? That's cr We've heard the names before. We've heard them all. And chances are there's somebody who has already lived with your child's exact same name. So you're not surprising anybody. I've heard Ralph and, and Cindy and Melinda and all these other weird names that you name. We've heard it. Absidy. We've heard, we've heard the shit. Okay, so so stop holding on to this information. And you know what it is? Most of us in our lives, we don't have information that people are just pining to get from us. People are just begging. They're so excited. And when you're expecting, you get all that attention. You become like little celebrities in a way. And everybody's like, oh, what's the, what's the due date, boy or girl? What's going on? And what's the, the name? Do you have this picked out? Do you know this? It's just like, it's almost like some paparazzi type shit with all the, with all the baby questions. And I think we kind of like it. And it's just like, you know, we got this little bit of nugget of information that people want. And if we don't give it to them, they're going to keep talking to us. I think that's what a lot of that shit is. Say your goddamn baby's name. Nobody's going to be surprised. People are going to call them that every single day. When your kid is six years old going to school, when they say their name at roll call, everybody's not going to be like, oh, my God, that's the coolest name ever. Your name was great. Can, you, can, we just, can we change our name to your name? No. It's some shit we heard. It's not special. Give up the goddamn name. Or, or just make some shit up. We're never going to see this kid. Just make it up. I can't. I can't stand that shit. <laughs> I can't. Ugh. But part of me gets it. Just just say, hey, we, we, we're we waiting until the baby is born. But the, just the, oh, we can't divulge. And no, just say no. If you, nah, I don't, I don't really know you. It's personal. Okay. 
But this whole thing of like, oh, no, well, you know, it's just spell. Shut the fuck up. No, nah, I'm good. I don't really know you. I'll take that. All right. Just like the people who didn't want to take the vaccine. I don't want to hear your reasoning why, unless it's for some legit medical reason. I don't want to hear you. You don't know what's in it. And this. I don't. Come on, man. The shit we put in our bodies every single day. Now you worried about the vaccine and you chain smoke. You drink alcohol and you worry about this fucking shot. Stop it. Uh, in in other news, I meant to bring this up earlier. Uh, I don't know what character's name because I did not watch the show. But Danny Masterson from that 70s show got 30 years for sexually assaulting two women. Crazy. 30 years. That just shows you, man, you never fucking know where your life is going to go. That guy was on a hit TV show for, what, almost a decade? At one point, probably one of the hottest shows on TV. And now this dude's going to spend the back half of his life in prison. In prison. That's crazy. Danny Masterson. Let's see, what's, what's, what's the internet say his net worth is? It's, it's zero at this moment. This guy, okay, they say he's worth about about eight to ten million dollars. That's a that's a lot to give up, man. That's a lot to give up in that's a lot to give up in the back half of your life, man, to make choices like that. That's uh absolutely insane, man. That's crazy. He's got a wife and a kid. That's uh man, some bad choices, my man. And then Ashton Kutcher and Mila Kunis is now on this like uh uh internet apology tour. Uh, because they wrote character letters for him and it got out. So they want to clean it up. My thing is, if you knew this dude was going to trial for some shit like this, why would you even write a character letter? It's like, I get, y'all spend a lot of time together, probably award shows on sets, and you didn't know that side of them. It's pretty heinous crime. And how would you feel if 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 the judge was a fan of both of, of, both of y'all and he was like, you know what? Instead of me giving him the max, maybe I'll give him the minimum. He can do 10 years for two assaults. You think you think you would feel good? You think that you think Ashton Kutcher and, and, and Mila Kunis, you think I would feel good if he got a lighter sentence because you wrote a letter? Stay out of that shit. <laughs> Them motherfuckers are like terrified. I I just sometimes you just gotta tell people no. But but I I, I get it. I get it. They're Hollywood people, and they figure, you know what? Nobody's gonna know this shit. Uh, that way, it, it, you know, he can't say anything bad about us, and it's the least we could do. But yeah, they use those letters against the victims. You, like you don't know what the fuck they're gonna do with that shit. I mean, if, if that, that dude was facing thirty years or, or life in prison, they're gonna do anything to defend him. Anything. Yeah, you got. We got to make better choices than that. <laughs> That's crazy. And uh, all right, so I gotta, I gotta get out of here, man. This it's it's fucking late. I got shit to do. Um, all right, so I watched this crazy documentary a couple of days ago. It's called uh, Scouts Honor. It's about all of the sexual assault cases and weird shit that has gone on with the Boy Scouts. Um, I didn't know this. Did y'all know this? There are like 82,000 cases against the Boy Scouts. 82,000. I looked this up because I was like, that, why does the 80s, that sounds kind of familiar in sports. And what it is is, uh, <laughs> this is not a great comparison, but I'm doing it. Uh, NFL passing leaders, NFL passing leaders. NFL passing leader. All time. There you go. Tom Brady is number one with 89,214 yards. Drew Brees is number two at 80,358. They're at 82,000 accusations or cases. So if the Boy Scouts was a football player, they would be the number two all-time passing leader. That's how many little boys these motherfuckers touched. 82,000 cases. 
Let that shit sink in. That's a lot of that's a lot of kids. How is this how is this thing even still allowed to exist? The Boy Scouts is still around. And in the documentary, they said since day one, literally day one, the first camp that they had, there was a guy there touching kids in 1908. So for over a hundred years, they knew this was a problem. Early on, I want to say, if I remember correctly, it was like the 19 teens or the 20s. They admitted like, yo, this organization kind of like attracts men that likes boys. And they didn't do anything about it. One dude won a case and part of his deal was he got to get access to this file that the Boy Scouts kept of all the cases that they had against people that worked for them. And it's just thousands of pages, hundreds of men, hundreds of stories. And they know all this shit and never said anything about it, ever. Like, this file has existed for decades. They knew about all this stuff. I, I, I was just shocked to hear this stuff about the Boy Scouts. Be honest, when you hear Boy Scouts, yes, we all think, oh, the, 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 uh, the camp counselors are weird, they'll touch you. Yeah, that became a, a joke. I didn't know how fucking serious it really was. You know, like any times it happens, it's serious, but I didn't know it was really that bad. Like it's it was terrible. And there, there's no way it's not going on. And I made a lot of assumptions about the Boy Scouts. Because it's Americana, it's this this it's this thing of like uh when you think of America, if you could give me a list of ten things about America, I wanna say for most people, the Boy Scouts would be on that list of, of, of things that are seen as some of the most American. And I, I assume that, oh, this is Boy Scouts of America. This is like one of the longest running organizations that teaches young kids how to, you know, uh tie knots and be leaders and and uh, confidence, and you're, you're just learning all these survival skills and building the fire, just all this stuff that I think it's like, okay, yeah, this is cool that, you know, boys are learning this stuff. I think this is this is good. And I'm thinking, like, this whole program is on the up and up, only the best of the best. This is the Boy Scouts. I feel like it's been around as, as long as some of our, our, our military services. It's, it's got to be some good people. Turns out they weren't doing any background checks. They weren't even checking people's IDs. They said it was too much of a hassle. It would it would deter volunteers. And it's just like, yo, you should be deterring volunteers. If someone doesn't want to volunteer anymore after you say, yeah, we have to have a background check if you're going to be around kids overnight in the woods. And they're like, nah, I'm good. Is that a guy that you want around kids? Or are you like, thank God we got these safeguards in place? And shout out to this dude. I want his name is uh, Michael Johnson. He's an ex cop, and uh, he got hired on with the Boy Scouts. I'm gonna say the early 2010s. Uh, he was supposed to be like the head of their uh, child protective program and all that kind of stuff, making sure they have all the safeguards in place. He's doing his job, doing his research, and realizing like, yo, there's not none of this shit. He gets access to this file, and he starts talking to this guy named Stephen McCowan, the general counsel. Like, yo, have you not seen all this shit? And the guy tells him no. And he goes, well, your signature is on all this stuff. And he goes, well, I've seen it, but I didn't read it. I just I just signed it, but I've never read it. And he was like, you didn't think to read these reports about people banging and molesting and touching and harassing kids? He goes, nah, man, I, I didn't. And this, this guy is probably one of the grossest people I've seen in any documentary. I mean, he's there. He was their general counsel. And to, to listen to this guy just make excuses and and what about all this all this stuff the the guy Michael Johnson brought it up he goes well this this happens everywhere it happens in schools it happens in offices it happens here it happens at football camp and soccer camp why are y'all picking on us it's just like what do you mean that just because it's happening everywhere else it shouldn't it, you shouldn't you shouldn't care you, you don't think this is a problem and he really didn't think. He was like, oh, it's just a social, it's a societal issue. It's going to be around. There's nothing we can do. Are you kidding me, man? And the stories from the 70s were, were crazy. 
I mean, there was a time where it was so popular, the Boy Scouts, that there were groups of grown men who were pedophiles that would just go around neighborhoods, pick out kids of single mothers and go, hey, we want to start the Boy Scout troop. We know you're a single mom. You need a break. You don't have to pay anything. So, like, these women need a break. They think that they're, they're sending these their sons off to do something fun and safe and they're going to learn skills and they're going to be around a father figure and these dudes are just doing the most heinous shit to these to these kids this one dude said that like they were flying in guys from western europe to sleep with these kids they were being bought sold traded videotaped this mom even would drop her son off at the hotel thinking that he was going to see a scout master that was from out of town the 70s were crazy, man. Like, people just let shit happen. I, I, I just don't, I, I can't understand as a parent, like, how could you just do that? And I'm, I understand it was a different time. People were a little bit more trusting. But you would think, like, dropping your kid off at a hotel, you would want to see what was going on and who they were with. I mean, just just crazy. I had no idea it was really that big of an issue. Again, we joked about it. Oh, you, you know, pedophile. We used to, it was, it became a punchline. But we didn't know how serious it really was. And again, one case is very serious. Not making light of it. But I had no idea. It, it almost seems like, what else is this thing for? It's just like, yeah, you might learn how to tie knots and uh, tie knots and swim and make a fire. But it seems like. This organization was really set up for people who were attracted to kids to have access to kids. In some of these cases, these guys said they didn't even do any badge work. There were no uni not, no uniforms, nothing. It was just that. Crazy. And again, how the fuck does an organization with this many cases, accusations against them, how do they still exist? Why do people still take their kids to Boy Scouts. There's I don't I, I still don't even think there's anything in place for background checks for certain positions. And also no pun intended there. Uh but yeah. So uh I'll be on the road here. I know that's a I know that's a rough stop. <laughs> that's a hard turn, but that's all I got this week. But I'll be on the road. Uh I'll be in let me pull up my calendar. I already had it. Bam. So uh, September 26th to the 30th, 30th, I'll be in Austin, Texas. Uh, on the 26th of that Tuesday, I'll be at Comedy Mothership doing Brian Simpson's show, Bottom of the Barrel. And then uh, I'm going to find some other stuff to do that Wednesday and Thursday. But the reason why I am there is September 29th and 30th, I'm at Cap City in the Red Room. So if you happen to live in Austin or in the area, please come check me out. I only need to sell 50 tickets tickets to sell out. That's it. 50 tickets each show. I only need to sell 100 tickets at Cap City to sell out both shows. So if you're in the area, come see me September 29th and 30th. All I need to sell is 100 tickets for two shows. Come check me out September 29th and 30th at Cap City. All right, then moving on to October, I have a nice little run, October 20th through the 22nd. A lot of different venues. Friday the 20th, I will be at the Attic Comedy Club. Tickets are on sale right now. Go check uh, Go check the website. That's the Attic Comedy Club in Columbus, Ohio. And then October 21st, I have two shows. I don't know where the location is, but the first show I will be doing a Don't Tell show. Uh, I want to say 7.30, 8 o'clock. And then later that night, I'm doing yet another uh, Secret Society show. I can't remember the name of the bar, but I absolutely love this venue. It's at this cool, kind of like a uh, hipstery uh, music venue, but the show is downstairs. The ceilings are low. It really reminds me of Big Hunt that we used to do in D.C. It's a packed room. The audience is right up on you. It's so much fun. I had the best time last time I was there, and I can't wait to do that again. So that's on the 21st. And then I'm closing it out at Hilarities. October 22nd, I'm going to be in the uh, the uh, Cabaret Room. I, th I believe that's around 60 or 70 tickets. Those tickets are also on sale. So please come see me e either at the, um, the Comedy Addict in Columbus, 
uh, the Don't Tell and the other Secret Society show. And if you're in Cleveland, Hilarity, Sunday night, October 22nd, one show, O-T-O-T-O. So I'm really excited about that. And then in November, I'll be at Indy Helium, November 17th and 18th. Uh, I believe that's also two shows. And I believe that is a 75-seater. So I think I only need to sell 150 tickets for those. Tickets are also on sale. And I'll close out the year at uh, Good Nights in Raleigh. Uh, yeah, I'm excited. I've never done a weekend uh, for New Year's. This is my first time. And uh, likely the last time. Um, I, I like hanging out with the family on New Year's. All right, and now lastly, for a local show, if you live here in the Charlottesville area, I have a new space. I'm really excited. I've been doing my podcast here at WTJU for the last couple of months. They've been very nice to me, very gracious. They also have a, a performance space downstairs here. It's a nice uh, space. It seats about 30 people, top of the line, so top of the line sound. There's cameras down there. Uh, they have a great lighting system down there, so I'm really excited. The plan right now is to do a once a month. I'm going to be running my hour. I'm going to have a couple people open for me. Uh, I plan on trying to do other shows there as well. But right now, it's going to be a once a month show. I would love to do it weekly. We'll see how it goes. Um, but as of right now, the first show is November 4th here at uh, the WTJU uh, station on Ivy Road. I'm super excited again. November 4th. Tickets will go on sale for that soon. Again, only 30 tickets. That, that will sell out pretty quickly. So once you see that link, please get tickets. Uh, I'm really looking forward to this. I really have been wanting the space to, to really work out and do my most vulnerable uh, material. And I feel like having a space of my own is really going to help me get there. I don't have to worry about pissing off a headliner, saying the wrong thing, running the like, doing all this stuff. I have a space to work on my art the way that I want to, and I'm super excited to bring that to y'all. So, again, November 4th, uh, be on the lookout for tickets. And with that being said, everybody, there's a show. That's a show. Do not forget to like and subscribe. One last thing. The podcast is finally up on iTunes. I was having some issues um, with, the, with the thumbnail, and uh, I, just, I just couldn't get it to clear. But I have been doing so much with these podcasts in the last couple of weeks that I got a little frustrated and I was making some silly mistakes. Um, and I had to give it a week or two to breathe. I came back to it and I go, oh, shit, this is all I needed to do. I got the thumbnail uploaded and now it's on iTunes. It was something that was bothering me for a while, but I knew I had to step away from it because it was just so frustrating. I was getting so mad. If any of you have ever done a podcast or you're dealing with any of this shit online, it can be frustrating, especially when it comes to posters and art and getting Instagram set up and YouTube because every single thing is every all like the um, the visual stuff is different. The YouTube thumbnails are one size, then the uh, profile picture has to be another one size. Then the profile picture has to be a certain size. And then if you want, it, it's just so much. So much going on with, with formats and sizes and this. It was a lot. I was frustrated and I had to let it go. But we're up and running on all things, uh, on all the streaming major streaming platforms now. I'm super excited. Again, thank you guys so much for watching my podcast. And, uh, oh, if you want any advice or anything anything like that, please write into the show, Okay. And the email address is the Chris Allen Show at gmail.com. Um, this Friday, I'm going to be interviewing a local uh, couples and sex therapist. Her name is Shay Graham. She's great. I did a, a, a panel with her a few months back at the uh, Black Love Soiree we did here in Charlottesville. So if you have any questions for a couples therapist, sex therapist, please email the show. Again, that email is the Chris Allen Show at gmail.com. So if you have a question for Shay, Get it to me by Friday. I'll uh, curate a nice list of uh, questions to ask her. I'm really looking forward to having her in the studio. Um, you guys have a great week. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Don't forget to share it. Help blow it up. I love doing this. That's why I'm here at almost 1 o'clock in the morning on a Monday. God damn it. Did I, I don't think I did my Wordle for the day. I've been trying to do Wordle, and I, I think I, I missed out on it. All right. I got to get out of here. Thanks, everybody. I appreciate it. Don't forget to share the podcast. Leave a review. Leave, leave, uh, yeah, 
Like it, share it, star it, whatever the fuck it is. Just do it, share it, propagate it, get it out there. All right, everybody, I'm out. Peace.